welcome once again to Unstoppable Mindset. I get to do something today I have not done on this podcast before, um, but I've been looking forward to it for quite a while. I get to talk to a real live, still absolutely functioning, incredible man who is also a musician. Kenny Aronoff has been a drummer for four decades. He has played with basically anyone that you can imagine, although I'm going to try to stump him with one in a second here, but he's played with all of the people in the who's who of, of music, no matter who they are. And, um, and I'm so really excited to have the chance to talk with, with him today. So Kenny, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, I'll stump you right at the outset. Have you ever played with George Shearing? Is that the guitar player who does no, a lot? No, George of- Shearing was a blind jazz pianist. He died. Oh, that okay. I, was, I know I'm thinking is it George is it another guy who had a close name. Nope, I never did play with George. Well, there you go. Oh, well, I found one. Well, um, I, I don't know. He had a, a trio yeah. that he worked with, but I don't know how much he worked with a number of people. Primarily, he played on his own. So yeah. That's not too surprising, but that's okay. But Stevie Wonder, John Mellencamp, and have you, have you ever, oh, I got to ask, have you ever um, played with Michael Buble? Uh, the singer? I think he came on stage for one of these big events where I play with everybody. I yeah. think I did play with Michael Buble. He was one of the guest solos. We were honoring whoever it was. You know, I, I'll play with 25 artists in one show. And yeah. I might have. He may have been paired up with somebody else singing. Yeah, so I think I did. Well, you know, um, we finally got to see him in Las Vegas. He's been my wife's idol for a long time, and I I enjoy him too. He's he's a singer who is saying the Great American Songbook, a lot of the old songs yeah. and all that. And he um, was in Vegas earlier this year, and so we got to go see him. And we actually really were very fortunate because we – we were escorted in early because my wife was in a wheelchair. And mm-hmm. so they brought us in. And then the usher came about five minutes before the show started and said, I've got two tickets that haven't been used down in the orchestra pit. And they said, I could give them to someone. Would you guys like them if the seat's accessible? And so of course we said, sure. Well, it was, and we ended up being 18 rows from the stage, actually two rows in front of his family. Wow. Um, and we got to see it was it was great. It was a wonderful concert. So that's awesome. Yeah, he's very, very talented. He's created his own niche and his own style. And that's a hard thing to do. It is. Um, but but he has done it. Well, with you, let's start like I love to start. Tell me a little bit about growing up and where you came from and all that kind of stuff. Well, I grew up in a very unique little town in Western Mass. I grew up in like an old country farmhouse in the hills of uh, Western Massachusetts, to be specific. What, what town? It was Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Made maybe 3,000 people. But what was unique about that town, it was basically a slice of New York City. I mean, New York City was three hours away. Boston was two hours away. And uh, there was a lot of arts, a lot of, you know, you had uh, theater people there. You had the Boston Symphony Orchestra in the next town over, Atlantic, Atlantic Mass which was three miles away. You had, uh, you know, Sigmund Freud's protege, Eric Erickson lived in our town, Norman Rockwell, the illustrator lived in our town. And he, I used to go over to his house and me and my twin brother, we, I think we were in second grade. We used to steal cigarettes from him. Uh, we had, a, uh, um, you know, uh, let's see, um, Norman Mailer was uh, the next house down from me. And, well, you couldn't see anybody's houses where I lived. It was all woods and fields. But Norman Mailer, the great writer, was right down yeah. the street from me. Uh, another eighth of a mile was a Patty Hearst used to live in the house, which they she had rented from the Sedgwick family, which is where Edie, Edie Sedgwick came from, that family. Uh, down the, the bottom of the hill was a, a summer stock theater where a lot of uh, actors would come up from New York to get out of the city. So I met like, you know, people like Frank Langella, Faye Dunaway, Ann Bancroft, um, Arthur Penn, the movie director lived in our town. And so he would direct some plays there. Uh, Goldie Hawn, Richard Dreyfus, it went on and on. It, and this, yeah. this, it, this seemed normal to me. Uh, I didn't realize Daniel Chester French, who, who was the sculptor 
who did, you know, the Washington Monument and, and Lincoln Memorial. He he at one point lived in our area. Uh, uh, when I went to Tangwood, which is the most elite student orchestra in the country, if not the world, it took me four years to get in there, but it's run by the Boston Symphony Orchestra. They only take seven percussionists in the whole world. When you, when you audition, I, I, I literally failed three years in a row, and in my fourth attempt, I got in. But on that property is Nathaniel Hawthorne's house. Right. And he wrote the Scarlet Letter. I mean, I could just go on and on. This area was just an extraordinarily, uh, uh, extraordinary place to grow up with. There was so many arts and, and and intellectual people. But the thing that was amazing about this town was that it didn't matter if you had money or had lots of money. Everybody, you know, houses were unlocked, uh, keys were left in cars. Uh, they, you know, it was a community. It was a it was a community where people supported each other. Yeah. So it was a great place that's, to grow up. That's one of the things I've always liked about Massachusetts. I lived in Winthrop for three years mm-hmm. back in the um, <clears throat> well, late 1970s, early 1980s. But I always enjoyed the camaraderie, and it was really hard to break into the community if you were from the outside. And I was viewed as an as an outsider. Yeah. Although I worked as yes, hard as I right. could to, you know, to try to be involved. But if if you weren't from there, it was really tough. By the mm-hmm. same token, people were very kind to me, so I can't complain a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I get it. It was great. I get it. And I was, you actually beat me to the question I was going to ask you if you had uh, ever made it over to Tanglewood. I never got to go up and hear the symphony yeah. in, <clears throat> in the winter, in the summer. Um, but I did... Um, needless to say, get over to hear the pops on several occasions. And, and that was fun. And it, there's nothing like the Boston pops. There's nothing like the Boston symphony for that matter either. Well, I got to perform timpani on that stage with wow. the, with the, and with uh, Leonard Bernstein conducting yeah. uh, Sibelius fifth symphony orchestra, which is a features the timpani in, and it's, it was incredible. So, you know, my, so, my my parents saw, they used to drag me to the concert, so I didn't really want to go. <laughs> and I ended up then being in, I we actually did Fourth of July with Arthur Fiedler and the Pops. We were all pops, mingled um, in with them. The half shell. Mm. Yeah. So you went to school, went to high school and all that. How long did you live there? Well, I lived there, you know, nonstop until I was 18. Okay. Uh, after 18, I uh, went to one year at University of Massachusetts at a- in Amherst, which is about an hour down the road. And then I transferred. Well, what I did was I got into the Aspen School of Music run by Juilliard after mm-hmm. my freshman year. And that's where George Gaber, the professor of Indiana University School of Music, now called the Jacobs School of Music, he was a he ran the, the percussion department at this school, and this was the number one school of music in the country, if not the world. Yeah. And I wanted to then I liked this guy. He was so deep. Uh, he was more than just a a, a percussionist. He was a philosopher and a well rounded man. Anyway, I I wanted to follow him and go to Indiana University. You have to realize, I mean, Indiana was the best school, and so I wanted to be in that school. And I demanded an audition up there, and he tried to talk me out of it. Try to come come back in January, and uh, we'll audition then. And then I said, absolutely not. I want to audition now, and I want to come to uh, Indiana University from the Aspen School of Music, which was a summer program. I convinced him. I did audition. You had to audition for four different departments to get in, and it just so happened that they had people from four different departments at IU teaching up there, like brass, mm. woodwinds, violin, percussion. And I auditioned, got in, and spent four years at Indiana University. Now, that's when I started to spend more time away from home yeah. because, you know, I was gone. You know, I'd come home for Christmas and the summer, but that was pretty much it. Yeah. And uh, it was an incredible education. What? Um, so... You, as you said, were dragged kicking and screaming to concerts and so on. What changed your mind? Uh, when I started to actually study classical music and start to perform in orchestras, I, I appreciate every style of music, and especially if it's done right. And I, I really, really enjoyed uh, classical music. I mean, it was, even though when I was a kid, you know, once rock and roll came out, it was like, you know, eh. Mm-hmm. Hell with the classical music, but it was still the soundtrack 
to my upbringing. My parents had classical music and jazz on the turntable. They were from New York City, and that was very popular in that that time for them. So I I didn't when I was ki- a kid I had too much energy to sit and watch a concert, but performing it, you different know, could, story. It was a different story, and then mm-hmm. I became really good. And eventually, got into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra after I graduated Indiana University, and uh, I I actually turned it down, uh, which was a shock to everybody because I'd spent five years becoming great at classical music. And I turned it down because, I mean, and thank God I did, because I was following my heart, mm-hmm. my, my deepest desires, my bliss, or, you know, whatever yeah. you want to call it. I wanted to still be in a rock and roll band. Now, let me back up a little bit. When I was 10 years old, playing outside of that con- that country farmhouse, and there was nothing to watch on TV back then. There was no cable. <laughs> There's not much more now either. But yeah, okay. but the uh, so, so what it, year was that? That was 19, I want to say 1950, no, 1963 or 64. When, okay, uh, okay. And and I, and, I, and my mom yelled at me and my twin brother to come in the house. And we were like, oh, my God, what did we do wrong? You know, like we thought we'd done something wrong. And what it was is that we, we come running across the lawn. And when we get into the family room, she's pointing to the black and white RCA TV set with the rabbit ears to get better reception and on the tv all of a sudden there were you know four guys playing rock and roll music you know with electric guitars and bass and they had long <laughs> hair and i don't know who they are but i i'd heard rock and roll on the radio but i'd never seen it live and i turned yeah. around i mean i it was at that very split second i realized what my purpose in life was before i even knew what those words meant yeah. And um i just knew i wanted to be doing that i wanted to be part of that i wanted to be a part of a team of guys that's playing music like they are. And I said to my mom, who are these guys? She said, well, they're the Beatles. The Beatles. I said, I want to be in the Beatles. Call them up. Get me in the band. And <laughs> and get me a drum set. I don't want to play piano anymore. Anyway, yeah. she obviously didn't call the Beatles up and didn't get me a drum set. So uh, that was where I was really blown away and realized this is what I want to do. So when I turned down the Jews from Symphony Orchestra, I turned down certainty for possibility. I turned down certainty for, you know, complete uncertainty. <laughs> and that it's was still I wanted what to, you wanted it. It's what yeah, you wanted to do. Exactly. And thank God I followed my heart because obviously it paid off. But it was a struggle, man. It was like took a long time for me to eventually run into a guy like John Mellencamp where he took a chance with me. And then it took a, a long time for me to, you know, plan a song play a, a drums on a song that got on the record. Mm-hmm. You know, the, when I first got in the band, I had only, and the reason why I got in the Mellencamp band is because I got the last record that they had and they were looking for a drummer and I just memorized everything that all these other drummers did on the record. And, um, well, in that case, it was just one drummer, but they, I memorized everything he played and so I won the audition. And five weeks later, we were making a record in Los Angeles mm-hmm. and I realized that you know or the producer basically fired me after two days because i had no experience making records you know to get songs on the radio to be number one hits Mm -hmm. and i was devastated you know i was like hey but i played with bernstein and bernstein and and it, it didn't matter i had no experience i didn't understand the value of teamwork to the level of it's not about me it's about we it's not about what I'm playing, it's about what can I play to make that song, get them the re- record that will eventually be played on the radio and become a number one hit single. It's that, the usual, I, I, it's the I usual never, gotta add value. Well, value to the team. That was the yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I mean by adding yeah. value. Yeah, because, you know, when you're trying to be great at anything, it's all about you or it's all about me. But to be Tom Brady or a great, uh, you know, a leader and, and be a great, uh, you know, do something great for the team. You, it is about the team. It's not about you. Serve the band, serve the song, serve whoever's in there. You know, serve, what can I do to get that song to be on the radio to be a number one hit hit single? Because if you yeah. sell, if you become, a, if you have a number one hit single, you're going to make millions of dollars. This is the way it was when I was a kid. So for you, Starting out more doing the I-oriented kinds of things, but then moving to the we, 
mentality, which yeah. is essentially what I hear you say. How did your style change? How did you change? How did it affect what you did? Well, I wasn't thinking about just what I want to play. I was thinking about what can I do to get this song on the radio. So, uh, in in in, the, and I had to think about how I can be the greatest drummer I can be for John Cougar Mellencamp songs. So I started to dumb my playing down and made it simple and tried to simplify what I was doing, and that really worked. I started listening to Rolling Stones, Creedence Clearwater. Bad company so groups where the drummers were playing with authority. They had they picked the right beat. They kept time. They made a groove. But ultimately, it was to make those so- that song better, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what I started changing. I simplified my playing, and I remember thinking, "Man, I got to learn to love this because if I don't love this, I'm going to suck at this. And if I suck at this, they should just get another drummer." And so I had to learn how to, you know, pivot into serving the song, serving the artist. Did you ever meet Buddy Rich? Absolutely. Uh, I kind of figured. Or or that other great drummer, Johnny Carson. <laughs> I never met Johnny Carson. I, I did. I remember, I remember watching a Tonight Show where the two of them oh, yeah. um, did drums together. Oh, and, it was uh, incredible. I yeah. played on a Buddy Rich tribute record, and uh, that was an, such an honor playing, you know, two two blazing... Well, one was a medium-tempo song, Big Swing Face, which was the title of an album, and the other was Straight No Chaser, which was blazing mm. fast. And uh, it was it was a, a very meaningful experience for me. You know, um, and, and clearly you respect that. Just listening to you, you, you respect that, that whole mentality, and you're approaching it with a humility as opposed to just being conceited which is which is great because that yeah. really is what makes for a good team person yeah i mean yeah i mean once again at that point i understand I stood serving you know serving the song serving the artist serving you know whoever whatever it is what can i do to be great that's cool so you know you you've done that you so you started playing. So was your first maybe big break in the whole rock um, world with John Mellencamp or yes. what happened after you turned down the Jerusalem symphony? Well, after I turned down Jerusalem symphony, I went home and I started practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week at my parents' house. I humbly moved back home and still didn't know how I was going to break into the rock and roll scene. And after a year, I, um, after a year, I, I decided to move to Indiana and start a band with a bunch of guys. And somebody, and one of their dads invested a lot of money into getting us, you know, a band truck, lights, PA. And the, the, the business model was to write songs, get a record deal, record those songs, and then go on tour. And um, after three years, we didn't get a record deal. And I was like, man, I don't know what, what I'm going to do. So I decided... I was going to move to New York City, which is one of the you know top three centers of the music business. And um, I ended up um, a week before moving to New York City, I have lunch with the singer-songwriter woman, Ruthie Allen, who asked what I was doing. I said, yeah, I'm going to New York. Uh, oh, you're going to crush it. Good luck. And then she said, you know, there's a guy in town. I don't know if you've heard of him. This John Cougar guy. He's on MTV, this new network, and he's made records. Do you know who he is? I said, yeah, I've heard of him. I wasn't a big fan of his music. It was very basic. And at that point, I was more into technique and chops, which is something, you know, usually when you're young, you're like, you want to do more is more. But uh, she said, yeah, man, he's they just cut off tour. They were opening up for Kiss, and he fired his drummer last night. And I was like, what? And I was in my head. I was going, ding, 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 ding. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's records, touring, MTV. Oh, my God, this is, my, this is like being in the Beatles. This is what I dreamed about. I went running out of the restaurant, went to a pay phone, and uh, called up, because uh, there was no cell phones, and I called up my buddy, Mike, and in the band, and said, look, I, I, I hear you might be looking for a drummer. I'd like to audition. He said, call me back in two weeks, and you know, we're trying to sort some things out, and eventually... I do get a call, or he called me back, and I did audition. And long and short of it is I 
I won the audition because I prepared intensely, practicing six, eight hours a day, trying to learn all the drum parts that were on the last record. I win the audition, and five weeks later, I'm out in LA making a record, which I got fired on, as I mentioned. <laughs> then what happened after you got fired? Well, that was crucial. That was a, a life-changing moment. When John said, well, the producer, I thought it was John, but it was the producer, wanted to get this record done. And I had no experience making records, so he wanted to get it done in eight weeks, which is not a very long time to record no. a new band and do overdubs, get vocals and mix and master. So he wanted to bring in his drummers. And when we had a band meeting, and I kind of knew I could tell something wasn't right. My my spidey sense said something's not right. We had a band meeting, and John told me I'm not playing on the record. And the words that came out of my mouth were life changing. When he said you go home at the end of the week, I said, "No friggin' way, am I going home?" And I remember the band looking like, "Oh my god, I can't believe Kenny did that." Because you know John was a pretty tough guy. Yeah. He's pretty tough, and so they thought, "What's going to happen next?" See, what hap was happening there is I was overwhelmed. I felt like a loser. I felt like a piece of crap. I felt mm -hmm. like just I was every negative thing, sad, you know, depressed. I mean, I was bummed. He was stealing my purpose, my whole deepest desires, my whole reason that I'm alive. He was taking that from me. And I just said, there's no way. And I told him, I'm not going home. And that'd be like me telling you you're fired. You go, no, I'm not. I'm like, yeah. Dude, you're fired. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm saying, what don't you understand about the word you're fired? So I just, I mean, I I am, um, I said, well, dude, am I still your drummer or what? And he goes, Well, yeah, but you're not playing on the record. And I started scrambling. I said, Well, I'll go in the studio and watch these other drummers play my drum parts on your record, and I'll learn from them and I'll get better, and that's good for you, because I'm your drummer. He was silent, didn't say a word. I went, oh, shit. I went, okay, um, uh, you don't have to pay me and I'll sleep on the couch. And then he said, perfect. And that's what happened. Hmm. And that was a life-changing moment because if I'd gone home, who knows what would have happened. Maybe they would have yeah. gotten another drummer. So that was, a, and John told me in my autobiography, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, he was saying, wow, he really respected me for that at that moment. He didn't realize I had that, you know, that I cared that much and I would, you know, stand up to him and, and demand to be there. And he, he respected me for that. So how, yeah. How much of it was ego and how much of it was really following your heart at that moment? It was more about fear and about following my heart. Okay. You know, I was like, um, I see what you mean about ego. I didn't want to go back home and I would have been ashamed to go back home and, and, but, but the, the, the fear of of losing this gig and the fear of the unknown of what comes next was making me want to fight for what I had. Yeah. Um, you know, and there are a lot of people who are excellent in their fields and they think very highly of themselves, um, which is fine, except that really detracts from the, the yeah. team orientation, which yeah. I, I know yeah. you understand full well. Mm-hmm. And so it it and it's great to hear that it was really more following your heart and really you wanting to do the right thing and having the courage of your convictions. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't see any other way out. And I've been, you know, banging my head trying to make it for four years after turning down the, Jer the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, and I was 27, and I thought, man, I don't know any option, so I want to do this. So I'm going to make this happen. And, you know, if I look back at my life, when I'm passionate about something, I make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I, it's easy to get along with me. I'm a great team player, but there is definitely a, a point where uh, I will, like, uh, draw a line in the sand and uh, I might be very nice about it, but um, you know, I this is I will fight for what I want, and it, it's usually backed by passion and desire. And when it's, anything is backed by passion, and desire, or purpose, or bliss, or whatever you want to call it, you know, you're gonna, you know, 
you're going to get what you want and it's going to be hard for people to convince you otherwise. And um, so, th yeah, that's pretty much, you know, when John was taking away my my job and I saw no other options and I'm starting seeing touring, MTV, regular TV and making records and being part of a band that I truly believed was going to make it and I was right. Uh, that I, there was no way I was going to just lay down, you know. Are you, are you a person who reacts to things, knee jerk reaction, although they may be right, or would you say that somehow you've internalized and when you make a decision, it's because you've really thought it through? Which doesn't mean that you have to take a long time to do it, but do you? Do you think that you are the kind of person who, when you say, I'm going to do this, it's the right thing to do, it's because you've really thought it through? Well, it's both. I mean, there's a lot of things I do uh, because I have thought it through, but there's, there's no question that at any given moment, if something comes across my table and it strikes me from a place in my heart, not my brain, but my heart and my passion, I will react and that's when I'll use my brain to maybe observe and uh, ask questions. But many times I've said yes before I even, you know, get deep into asking questions. When something blows me away and I'm excited. Paul McCartney called me up and said, I want to make a record with you. I mean, it would just be an automatic yes. Mm -hmm. You know, before I'd find out, no, we're going to make it in uh, Siberia and uh, there's no heat in the building or something. You know what I mean? I'm just yeah. going to say yes right away because it's Paul McCartney. And that's, well, yeah. 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 I mean, that would make sense. But you've also, you've met him, you know him, you've learned to trust too. So it's not like it is an unintelligent decision to just immediately say yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess with Paul. Yeah, of course. But I mean, you know, just, just take somebody else, you know, I don't know somebody that I don't really know that well. Well, sure. You know, and I would, if it's the right person, I'm going to go, yeah, right away. You know? Well, yeah, exactly. But still, and the, if it's the right person, part of it is very relevant. It still means that you've done some thinking about it. One of the things I love in listening to you tell these stories is like with John Mellencamp, you really said, look, I want to learn. You know, if I'm, if I'm your drummer, and there's a problem with this record and all that, then I want to learn what I need to do so it won't happen again. And the real great part about it is that you say, I want to learn. Um, I love people who are mm. always interested in learning and, and becoming better and don't think so highly of themselves that they don't have anything else to learn. Well, no, that's true. Uh, you know, I've, I won't mention any names, but I remember going up to a very, very famous singer, and I remember saying, I could see he was frustrated, trying to explain what he wanted to do. I got off the drum set, went right up to him. I said, listen, dude, there's nothing I can't do. You know, you just have to be very specific about what you want me to do, and I will do it because I can do it. And uh, I want to learn. I want to be great. I want to. And when you're working for an artist, you're in a place of service. So I want to get it. I know I can get it. It was just a disconnect for 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 the explanation, and that took a, took a while to work out. But the bottom, I saw his frustration, but I was trying to let him know, dude, I can do anything you want. I, I'm capable, and I meant and he, it. Again, the operative part is it sounds like you worked it out. Well, I've worked it out enough. You know, I've done so many big shows. But I mean, with, so many with that person, you were able to work it out? Oh, with that person, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. my point. And so yeah. you do... <clears throat> you do explore and that is that's a, a, a wonderful trait mm -hmm. and characteristic that um, more of us should develop um, we should have confidence in ourselves to know what we're capable of and know what we are capable of learning mm -hmm. and yeah. then go forward which is what i'm hearing from you yeah absolutely the yeah. first time i did a speech um in public after september 11th I got a call from a pastor of a church and he said, I want you to come and tell your story. He had, they had, I'd been on Larry King live two weeks before first time I'd ever been on CNN and Larry King live, but it was again after September 11th. And I was wow. used to 
being in a, in a public setting. So it didn't bother me a lot, but this guy calls up and he says, I want you to come and tell your story. We're going to be doing a service to honor all the people who were lost from New Jersey in the world trade center. And so I said, okay, I'm glad to do that. And then I said, um, just out of curiosity, any idea how large the service will be, how many people will be there? And he said, well, it's going to be outside probably about 6,000. You know, I'd never done a speech before. And (laughs) my immediate reaction was it didn't bother me. I said, okay, great. Just wanted to know. And I've done some things in church before and I've, I've talked in some public settings, but not to do a, a, a real speech like that. Yeah. But you know, I knew that it didn't matter to me if it was 6,000 or six. Um, for, for me, um, there were techniques to learn. And over time, I learned that good speakers don't talk to audiences. They talk with audiences and they work to engage people in, in, when the, in their speeches in various ways. And it's so much fun to do that. But 6,000, and it, and it really just worked out really well. And um, there were other people there. Lisa Beamer was there. Her husband was mm-hmm. Todd Beamer, the guy on Flight 93 who said, let's roll. And, you know, it was a, a pretty incredible night, and I'll, I'll never forget it. But, you know, you know what you can do. And when you really know your capability, but are willing to share it and grow and learn, what more can a body ask for? Yeah, I mean... My I, my thing about uh, being alive on this planet is to get the most value out of this life. I'm not. Uh, I I hope I hope there's something after this, but whether there is or not, the point is is to get the most value out of this life. When it's very short, so I I'm not one to sit. I'm just wired that way. I, I'm not yeah. sitting sitting on the couch just you know hanging out on a daily basis. You know, I, I, I've played on 300 million records sold. I've toured with some of the greatest bands uh, in the diver- as diverse as, the, you know, the Highwaymen, which is Johnny Cash, mm. Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, Wayland Jennings, mm-hmm. Little Richard to Jerry Lee Lewis to the Smashing Pumpkins and Tony Ioni from Sabbath to the Boston Symphony Orchestra and Ray Charles and B.B. King to Sting to the Beatles to the Stones. And I feel fortunate that I got to play with so many different people because you get pigeonholed in my business. You're a rock drummer, you're a country drummer, you're this drummer, you're that drummer. So, and that that definitely ties into uh, the ability to be able to connect, communicate, and collaborate with people because who do they want in the room with them? It's not just the most talented musician. It's somebody they want to hang out with. Mellencamp used to say, look it, I need people I get along with. I'm only on stage for two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. Well, the rest of the time, I got to s- hang out with you guys. So I want people <laughs> I get along with. Right. You know, and, and, and I get, I totally got that. But the, the thing is, is that to get the, the, what I like about getting the most value out of life is that I'm wired to grow and learn. And the you, it's like building, you know, a skyscraper, you know, the top only exists because you built a foundation from the bottom and you work your way up and you get, you have to be strong and you build. And I don't believe in mistakes or failures. They're just events that get you to the top. And if the words mistakes and failures bring a negative energy to your body. So I don't even use those words anymore. Everything's an event. Something that doesn't work out the way you want is a learning experience. It's a gift. And I'm like uh, basically Tom Brady. You know, you're always trying to get into the end zone. If you get, uh, if you fumble, you get sacked or whatever, whatever. Life is filled with sacks and dropping the ball. It's like, where are you trying to go? What's your North Star? My North Star is the end zone. So that happened. What did I learn from it? How are we getting in the end zone? And that's the way I look at life. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to, to extend your, your thought, I, agree about the whole concept of mistakes and failures. For me, um, uh, and people have said it, um, and I and I firmly agree with like Zig Ziglar and others who say that mm-hmm. there's no such thing as a mistake. It's a learning experience. And the question Absolutely. is, do you learn from it? And that's the real issue. Do you learn from it? Yeah. Um, and I, I, we're after September 11th, I started speaking to people and traveling the country and still do and enjoy it immensely. But one of the things that I realized over the last three years with the pandemic is that I've never 
taught people some of the techniques that I learned along the way and used just because they came along um, to not be afraid on September 11th. I had developed a mindset Mm -hmm. that told me that I can observe, I can focus, and I don't need to be afraid. So we're starting to actually, we're, we just submitted the first draft of a book about learning to control your fear so that mm-hmm. you don't be an individual who, when something unexpected happens, you let fear, as I put it, blind you. You mm-hmm. learn how to use that fear to help heighten your senses and direct you. And one of the things that I talk about is the whole concept of how much do you at night take time just to be introspective and look at the day and what happened today? What, what do I learn from this? Mm -hmm. How could I have done this? I was successful with this, but how could I have been even better? Or this didn't go well. Why? And what Mm -hmm. can I do about it? And really think about it. You know, that's good stuff. That's very Mm -hmm. valuable. That's a, that's a good way to learn because you can learn from yourself and, 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 Sometimes we have to repeat things many, many, many times to finally get the lesson. But if you do what you just said and you take inventory on what went on that day, you could possibly learn that lesson way quicker. Well, and I've changed my language a little bit. I used to say that you are your, you're always going to be your own worst critic. And I've realized that's negative. Uh, I'd rather say I'm my best teacher if that's I allow good. myself to do it. And that is so true, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. That anything negative, you should throw out the window and pivot it or flip it so that it's always positive. And there's definitely always another narrative. And the positive narrative is always going to serve you better than the negative. Always will. Um, There's no great value in being negative and putting yourself down. You can be frustrated by something that didn't go the way you thought. Well, why didn't it? And, yeah. it, and it may very well be that there's a legitimate reason why it didn't work out. But if you figure that out and you allow yourself to teach you about it, mm-hmm. you, won't make, you won't make the same scenario happen again. Um, you will be successful the next time. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I totally agree with you on that. So um, have you done anything in the music world dealing with rap? Uh, I've never been on a rap record, but when, you know, I remember being in the Mellencamp band and that was a long time ago. I left in 96. I remember I was listening to some Snoop Dogg and I was grabbing ideas from Mm -hmm. those records and bringing it to Mellencamp. That's what we were always encouraged to do. Back then there were budgets long. We could make spend nine months making a record and you could do a whole record, throw it away and start from scratch. (laughs) But I was getting ideas, rhythmic ideas, loop ideas. Um, I, I, I remember playing sleigh bells on a song. So Snoop Dogg played sleigh bells on a whole ben- bunch of songs on early records in the 90s. And I copied it. And John loved it. It's a different thing. And uh, so, I, yeah, in that regard, I did learn a lot from the rap music. I've, I, I don't know. My, my view of rap has always been, I think it's a great art form. I'm not sure that I view it in the same musical way that, that some people do because it's not so melodic as it is um certainly a lot of poetry and they kind of put poetry and words to to music in the background yeah. but i also believe it's an incredible art form listening to some of the people who do rap they're clearly incredibly intelligent and they're they're pouring their hearts out about what they've experienced and what they see sometimes in ways that you don't even hear on regular music Oh yeah, I mean, there's no question that um, it's it's a it's a, a form of music. It's a reflection of of uh, you know uh, where society's at. You know, I mean, the arts always reflect where people are at, and mm-hmm. there's a, a huge audience out there. There's a lot of people that can relate to this whole style of of uh, music or what rap is. Uh, it's it's uh, lyrics are very powerful in that. They, it's mostly centered around a beat and lyrics, and uh, you, you a lot of attention is drawn toward that as opposed to just take a band where they have you know two guitar players playing melodic lines and a keyboard player on melodic line, and there's none of that really going on. Not not to the extent of of the, yeah. that in rap music. And um, although some people have added, Dr. Dre added a lot of stuff 
to mm-hmm. the people he's worked with, like you know Eminem. But still, it's more centered around the voice, the person, um, and, and the um, message. And the message. Oh, absolutely, the message. But you know, the thing is, is it's you know, I guess it's up to everybody to decide. You can call it whatever you want. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. like it's if, if somebody's digging it, they dig it. If they don't, they don't. Is that something? Yeah. Well, it is absolutely an art form, and it's an art form that should be as respected as, as any. Um, yeah. And certainly it is, to pardon the pun, struck a chord with a lot of people, and that's fine. Um, and it's And it's great that there is so much of it going on. So what kind of tours have you been on lately? What kind of music have you done or what's coming up? I just finished the Joe Satriani tour, who's one of the greatest guitar players on the planet. Uh, uh, It was just an evening with Joe Satriani. It's a very tech. The music is very technical. It it was, uh, it was great for me because I was, uh, you know, my, my technique excelled uh, tremendously to play those type of songs. I'm going to Europe with him, uh, let's see, April, May, and part of June for nine weeks. I'm doing a thing called G4, which is a, a camp that he does in Vegas, which will feature the guitar players, Eric Garrell, Steve Lukather, uh, Steve Morris, uh, uh, let's see, Peter Frampton, and a bunch of other people. Mm. Uh, Basically, when I finished the Joe Satriani tour, I had 85 songs waiting for me to learn, uh, some of which I recorded my studio. I have a studio called Uncommon Studios. I tried to push back all the records I was going to make while I was on tour to when I got off tour. I did that, and then I just finished doing a show maybe three nights ago with Jim Mercer, the owner of the Indianapolis Colts, who's showing his museum. It's an American collect- collectibles, as he calls it, or collection. It's not just musical instruments, but it could be like, uh, you know, American culture type stuff like Abraham Lincoln's handwritten letters, uh, you know, uh, Edith Wharton's writings, um, Muhammad Ali's gloves and belt from the uh, Thriller from Manila fight. I mean, it just goes on and on. And um, so I did a concert with him, but that featured like Kenny Wayne Shepard, Ann Wilson from Heart, John Fogarty, Buddy Guy, and Stephen Stills. And that was 30 songs I had to learn and perfect. I write everything out. I know every tempo. I know all the st- song structure. So my role is not just a drummer, but it's also to kind of keep everybody in it straight and in line. We only have one 12-hour rehearsal the night before, and the next day it's it's the show. So... It's massive preparation. And next week, I'm going to do Billy Gibbons, or this week, on Thursday, I'm going to do Billy Gibbons' uh, birthday party at the Troubadour. And uh, so I had to learn those songs. Uh, I'm uh, finishing, I'm starting to edit my second book. It's a self-help book. It's about, uh, you know, living your life loud and how, and the, the, how important time is in the short life we live. Uh, that goes into my uh, speaking World, I have an agent, and I do, uh, you know, inspirational speaking. I'm mostly corporations, and so that book is kind of like has a lot of the stuff that's in that speech, but a lot more with a lot of action items and takeaways. Uh, I'm just uh, I just put out a drum book um, during the pandemic. I transitioned to my studio where people send me files and I make records for them or I play drums on their records. I turned it into a, a, a place where I can do virtual speaking. And now I may be launching a very, uh, a podcast where I have a whole team that will be, you know, a producer, a director and everything. And I can do that from my studio. I have a wine that just came out, Uncommon Wines. It just won an award. It's a Cab Syrah. Uh, it's a limited edition. But yeah, I got I got a lot going on. <laughs> Well, and that keeps you busy, and it's obviously something that sounds like a lot of fun for you. Absolutely. At this point, it's like, if it's not fun, I ain't doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you can't have fun, then what good is the world anyway? Right? Yeah. It, it's <laughs> it's up to you, man. It's up to you. You know, this, you know, we, everybody has, well, most people have options. So, you know, uh, some people, you know, maybe less than others, but. You know, I just say, and it's all in your mind. It's a mindset, you know. You can make things better 
or more difficult in, in love is up to you. And I think you really hit the nail on the head, if you will. Everyone does have options. And a lot of times we have more options than we think we do. We undersell ourselves. We underestimate ourselves, which is mm-hmm. why I love doing Unstoppable Mindset, because my goal is to help people recognize that in reality, they probably are a whole lot more unstoppable than they think they are. Yeah, well, exactly. But only you can figure out your power. It's up to the individual. And this is not a mental thing. This is an emotional thing. You have to feel your power. Right. And and I think it's like a thing I call RPS, repetition, is the preparation for success. And that could be anything. Anything you do over and over again, you you get better at because you're doing it over and over again. And sometimes it takes longer to get somewhere with one thing than other things, but it's, you can't just set it and forget it. You can't just Mm-mm. like be successful one day and think that's it for life. No, I used to practice on the uh, Joe Satriani tour, a song called Satch Boogie uh, twice a day. And people go, why man, you you play that great. I said, because I play it every day. I'm preparing every day yeah. for playing it at night. That's yeah. why it sounds so good at night. And when I don't, then I usually learn a lesson that uh, I need to do that. I'm talking about the more technical things, you know. Sure. Well, and and that brings up the question of, like, you're preparing to to do the event at the Troubadour and so on. How do you prepare? What is it you do to learn the songs? How does all that work? I write every single note out that I'm going to play. Um, I got the charts right here uh, for the viewers. I can, uh, I'll hold up one sheet of music it's very detailed i write every single note out i got the tempo i know exactly what i do then i just drill it i run through it i practice these songs when we're done i'm going to practice that whole show tonight tomorrow i'll practice it twice and then thursday i'll practice it and then do the show do you record your practice sessions so you can listen to them or do you no i don't and that that would be a real that's a good thing to do. No, I, I don't. Uh, uh, it's, you know, that's a good, that's a great way to learn, but that's also time consuming. Well, it, well, it is, uh, but you then get to hear it in a sense from the perspective of listeners. Um, so I do, but I, while I'm playing, I'm listening too. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And that's why mm-hmm. for you, it may or may not be um, the, the best thing to do. I know for me, when I do a podcast interview, I will go back and listen to it again. And I do that because I want to see how I can improve it. And it's the easiest way for me to do it. I listen to myself when I'm talking and I listen to the person who I'm talking with and I do my best to interpret their reactions and so on. But still for something like this, I get to learn a lot by, going back and listening to it. And as I, as I tell everyone I talk with about this, if I'm not learning, and it's the same thing with speaking, if I'm not learning at least as much as my audience or my guest, I'm not doing my job well. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's no question listening to what you do is great, great way to learn. I'm usually moving so fast and doing so much that I just, uh, yeah, I, I don't have time, but that's a no question. I think that's a great way to learn. You know, and when I see myself, I feel myself speaking. Oh my God, that's so humbling, right? Yeah. Oh my it's, God. So and and it's such a when you're speaking and you're doing an auditory thing like that, it probably is best to go back and listen to it. I remember when I worked at the UC Irvine radio station KUCI and was program director. I worked to get people to listen to themselves, and they they wouldn't yeah. record their shows, so we actually put a tape recorder in a locked cabinet, a cassette machine, and we wired it. So whenever the mic was um, live, the, um, the voice was recorded. And then we would give people cassettes and we would say, you got to listen to it before the next show. Yeah. It was really amazing how much better people were at the end of the year. Some people ended up going into radio because they were well enough, they were good enough that they could be hired and went on to other things. Yeah. And it was just all about, they really started listening to themselves and they realized what other people were hearing. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, 
That's a great. Uh, I think that's brilliant. You know, it's a it's always a challenge. So so for you, um, what was the scariest or the 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 weirdest show that you ever did or performance you ever did? Well, probably the, one of the more scary moments in my life was uh, when I was twenty barely 23, and maybe I was still 22. I, uh, for my senior recital at Indiana University, you, you know, I was a performance major. I, I, you, the way we learned how to play melodies and have that type of uh, um, education was we would play violin music or cello music on marimbas. Well, for my senior recital, I picked a virtuoso violin concerto that Itzhak Perlman played as his encore in a concert I saw when I was a freshman. And it's so beautiful, but highly technical. And uh, I spent one year, two or three hours a day, learning that one piece, one of four pieces on my senior recital. And uh, I, it was, I, I learned it so well that my professor wanted me to audition for a concerto competition, and I won which meant that I performed that piece with a 60-piece orchestra in an opera hall bigger than the New York Met, which is an Indiana University. Now, granted, this is the number one school of music in the country for classical music. So this is there's no hand-holding, there's no coddling, there's no trophies. This is like being, I want to almost say like being a Navy SEAL, especially yeah. with my teacher. But that guy helped make me, and I was the right student for him, become who I am and the discipline that, that I learned from was extraordinary. But anyway, uh, I'd never, you know, usually when you're a percussionist, you're in the back of the orchestra. So yeah. this was the, you know, here they're rolling a marimba out in front of the uh, this uh, big concert hall, and I'm in the wings, you know, with a tuxedo, and I walk out like the solo violinist, and I was crapping in my pants. And the whole thing is memorized, <laughs> and... Uh, Oh man, I was just terrified, but I, I crushed it. Well, you took control of your fear. I did. Well, I tend to I tend to take fear and use it as 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 a not a weapon, but I use it. I, it'll turn. I'll turn it into a power. It is uh, a but, power. But on the other hand, uh, we do have the ability to sabotage ourselves. And mm -hmm. that's something as a, as a child that it would do because you have self-doubt. You're small. Everybody around you is big. You've got parents, teachers, coaches, whoever, telling you, Kenny, that's wrong, bad, bad, bad. And as a little guy, you know you're trying to please everybody. And I remember my teacher saying to me, sometimes when I make a mistake, he'd look at me and go, Kenny, are you afraid of success. And I'd be like, what is he talking about? But I realized that when you're younger, you start to think you're going to make, oh, I'm going to mess this up. Oh, here it mm -hmm. comes. And you do. And you do. But now that I'm older, I realize from this, this, I hate that so much that I want to be successful so much. I overpower any of those feelings. I'm like, it's more like I got this and I'm going to get it. And I believe it, but I can't tell anybody who's listening. There's a, a quick remedy for that. You don't take a mm -mm. pill and all of a sudden you become that. That's a long process. Because I used to think, how long am I going to end up being like this where I sabotage myself, where your fear takes over? Now, yeah. I use my fear as my strength. I don't even know if I want to call it fear. Somebody says, you get nervous when you do Kennedy Center Honors or any of these shows. At this point, hell no. Yeah. I don't get fearful. I get serious. I'm like in the Super Bowl, and I know I can win. But I also know that things will not necessarily go the way you want because you're not the only one on that stage. Right. There's other people. It's my job at any moment to be able to adapt or die. You adapt immediately, you fix it, or you die. And I'm not about dying. Have you ever had any experiences when you were on stage and, and in a sense, you blew it, uh, but then you recovered or anything? Like oh, that? yeah, all the time. Well, course, it depends yeah. what you want to call blow it. Blowing it, yeah. To, to me, it would be I, just one note in the wrong place is, to me is yeah. something I don't like. But the, 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 the huge, uh, the place I'm in now is I know very, very, very 
I know how important it is is to forget about that and to stay focused and stay in right. the game. It's like Tom Brady getting sacked in his two minute drill to win the game. He gets sacked. He's got to be. He can be pissed off for a second, but he immediately focuses on end zone touchdown, end zone touchdown. What right. did I learn from that experience? We aren't running plays that direction anymore. We're doing this. You take it and you flip it. It becomes your power. So if something goes wrong. Uh, it, there's a part of me, of course, that's like really pissed off. But I also understand deeply in my gut that you've got to blow that off and focus on how you're going to be a bad mofo. And I don't talk about my mistakes. And, 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 no, I don't have mistakes. Well, I don't, don't talk about the things that don't work out because you don't want to talk about them. You're giving it too much power. You yeah. you just move past it. If somebody brings it up to you, you then can have a discussion. But unless somebody brings it up to you, you just move on. You don't think about it and you don't dwell on it because that will weaken you. Every time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely every time. every time. And you know, it's as we said, it isn't it isn't a mistake. You you did something, you you played a wrong note, but you really spend so much time practicing, mm -hmm. you do get it to be, and I don't use this in a in a way to negate it, it becomes very rote by the time you're playing in, in the actual performance. You have really worked to make sure that you truly understand what the event is <clears throat> what the music is that you're supposed to be playing and you're used to it. I would also wager that no matter how much you practice, when you get up on stage, now you're in a dynamic where you have the whole orchestra or the band or whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if there are times that you adapt on the fly as well. Absolutely. You do. I mean, the thing is like this concert I just did, with all these great artists, um, there were, the, you know, people, I have everything written out, but people would drop in choruses or dropping parts and I adapt and I direct, I help mm -hmm. people, you know, or if I, if I, if there's something I space out or something, I'm very quick at self-correcting and, um, you know, making it work out, you know, that's what it should be. That's what it, exactly. That's what it should be. It's I mean, the team. It's, yeah. And, and you, you, you will let yourself down if you get sucked into, there's a lot of ego in, in uh, getting drawn into, oh, woe is me and failure and all that. Yeah. You've got to push that aside. You've got to be centered like a, like a Navy SEAL or a warrior king, you know, or warrior queen where you, People are looking to you to lead and looking to you for strength and wisdom. And I want to be that person. I am that person. And at the same time, you also know when you're leading, if you're a good leader, you know when to let somebody else take the lead because they have a skill that works in that particular moment. Absolutely. I call it lead them to lead. Mm -hmm. Help them lead, assist them to lead. Without saying anything, you do the, your job to help them feel like they can lead. So how did you get involved now in starting to do public speaking kinds of things and travel around and do some of that? Well, I wrote an autobiography called Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, and people were asking me to speak a little bit. I had done about 30 years of drum, drum clinics, master classes, where I would speak. It was a show. So, But to, to, to speak... Like we're talking about, I had to really work, uh, develop a craft. It wasn't, you know, I I worked with some writers. I, I built websites, and got rid of them, got different ones. I went and spoke to an agent, and he told me what it really means to be a speaker, what you need to do. I did what he told me to do and came back to him two years later and uh, showed him what I had done, and he was blown away. He said, I want to work with you. So he started we started working together and he started telling, mentoring me and I started to put together a show. I had myself filmed, uh, you know, um, and I kept developing it and honing it down. And, and now, you know, I've got, you know, teamwork, leadership, innovation, creativity, connecting, communication, collaboration, realize your purpose, staying relevant speech. And uh, it's, I do perform during the speech, I have a set of drums there. That's the entertainment part. 
mm-hmm. people want to see me perform because I'm a drummer. But yeah, the the message is very powerful, and it's uh, it 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 it, it it's not just. I mean, I've done this. My success in the music business is a proof of, you know, how to go from this little kid from a town of 3,000 to 40 years. Well, not 40 years later. It's a lot of years later. And after that, at this point, it's 60 years later, how I became what I had, how I became success, successful and have stayed successful in a lot of those skill sets and what I learned in the music business applies to these other businesses I do which also applies to other people's businesses. So I speak about that. I just, to answer your question a little bit more succinctly, I just, I put together a show. I have an agent and we've been building off of that. And I just am doing more and more of that. Tell me about your book a little bit. Well, Sex Drum, you mean the the, the autobiography or the The new one? one? No, the, right now, the autobiography, the first one. Yeah, that's basically my life story. It's about how I came from that little town of, you know, of in Western Mass, Stockbridge, and how I went to, uh, you know, wh- how I went from there to where I am now, basically mm-hmm. in a nutshell. And there's all kinds of stories, you know, sm- you know, Smashing Pumpkins, Bob Seger, John Mellencamp, Bon Jovi, The Rolling Stones, meeting Bill Clinton. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of funny stuff. There's a little bit of drama. It's a little bit of rock and roll wildness. But the bottom line is the big message that the thread through the whole book is I've worked my ass off and still working my ass off. And uh, I hear you stay in great shape. It must be from all those beating of the drums. It is, but it's also I, in my new book, I have a, the a Healthy Life is a Wealthy Life, which is a basic eight-step program on how to stay healthy, which affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, uh, I won't go through all the details of it, but it's it's definitely a setup. And you know, I, you know, I'm 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 aware of what I'm eating. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'm not perfect, but I'm aware of everything I put in me. So, in other words, if I have a day where I'm eating not as well as I as I usually choose to, then I know how to make up for it the next the day. Next and day, I do yeah. exercise. Every day. And of course, playing the drums. I mean, you're doing a three hour show, you're burning thousands of calories. Yeah. So there's that, you know, which is, which is really pretty cool. And so you're, you're in a profession that keeps you active anyway, which is, which is always good. You know, you can, it's hard to tough to, to argue with that, isn't it? Yeah. It's great. It's phenomenal. I love it. Did you, did you self publish the first book or did you have a publisher? I have a publisher for that. It was a Hal Leonard Backbeats, which is now the now is Rowan and Littlefield. I did an audio version. This new book I have is is going to be self published. I I'm working. I'm writing it for the second time, and it will be. They have a marketing team, and but I own the book. Mm-hmm. You know, and I may possibly look for a publisher after that. But the, the, this new book is more self-help book. It's basically, as I think I mentioned earlier, it's taking what I'm saying in my speech, but with a lot more information of extending it, you know, that information so people can, you know, if they want to hear more about what my my philosophies are and, you know, how I made it and how I'm staying successful, they can read that book with action items, exercises. And then if they want to take it a step further – then we there will be a website eventually where people can uh, reach out to me and I will coach them. Well, and when you make that website, I'd love to help make sure that it's accessible with Accessibe and uh, the company that oh, I work cool. with. And we'd Thank love you. to to make sure that it's um, a website that's available to everyone to use. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. S- well, you know, this has been a lot of fun. And we have done what I love to do, which is lose a little bit of track of time. So we've even gone over an hour and Mm. I have a cat in the other room who's yelling at me to come and (laughs) see her, but you know, we all have our crosses to bear, but if people want to reach out to you or reach out and learn more about you, where to get the book, um, maybe find one of your speeches or whatever, how would they do that? Well, the first thing they can do is go to my website, www.kenny.com. Aronoff.com. Would you, you spell, just, please? It, it's uh, K-E-N-N-Y-A-R-O-N-O-F-F.com. And the books are on the on that website. There's a, a 
a little bit of me speaking. If you go to the speaker page, there's a little button you can click. You can see me speaking. There's a form where you can reach out to me if you want me to record drums on your record or just connect with me. And I think if you want to hire me to speak, I think that I believe on my website, there's my agent's um, you know, email address, how to hire me. And and then of course I'm on every all the social media. I'm on TikToks, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, we found you on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good to be connected. Well, Kenny, I've absolutely enjoyed this. It's everything I expected and more, and have really learned a lot. I'm very grateful for you awesome. being with us today. So I really appreciate that. And I hope everyone that you who are listening find this as enjoyable as I did and that you will give us a five-star rating when you're done listening. And uh, please let us know what you think about it. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me at Michael H I at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. So hope you'll do that. Or you can go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. Definitely love to hear from you. Hope you enjoyed all that Kenny had to say. And we're looking forward, Kenny, to having you back to talk some more about some of this stuff. Well, maybe I'll come back when my book comes out next year and, Ooh, and we can talk great. about that. We can. And that would be a great thing to do. And I'm, I'm going to hold you to it. So let us know because we want to let everyone else know when it comes out. Okay. Um, but let us know so we can have you yeah. back. But again, thank you for being here with us. And we are looking forward to you coming back again. All right, man. Thank you so much, Michael. And uh, I'll see everybody down the road, I guess. <laughs>